Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We do have captioning at the bottom of the screen for this one. Um, so that's why it looks a little bit different than it might have in other webinars that you've attended recently. Um, this is the tax exempt bond program or bond training. You guys have all asked for it for quite a while now. So we, we've gotten one put together. Uh, bond program has had a lot of changes in the last year, maybe, um, kind of in how we've monitored and kind of what's coming uh, going forward. So we wanted to get this out before the end of the year. My name is Kara Pola. I'm going to be the presenter today. I do have Amy Hammond with me. Um, she is going to moderate the questions and chat box. So if you have questions or concerns or something is unclear, please put that in the questions box so that we can make sure everybody leaves here this morning uh, with a good understanding of the bond training or the bond program and um, as many questions answered as possible. At the end of the webinar, you will be prompted to complete a survey. Please do that. That helps us with um, future trainings and kind of to know where we, you know, hit or miss the mark for this one. And then if you think of any other questions, you can also put those in the uh, survey response as well so that we can respond by email um, after, you know, later this week with, with some detailed answers about your uh, bond questions. So as always, we've got our mailing address here and our physical address. If you ever need to send us something, you would do so at the mailing address. If you ever wanna drive by and see where the magic happens, that's that East 11th Street address. It's gonna be a little bit underwhelming, but the building is there, there's flags on the front of it. It is a government or state government building. Um, and we do you know, office out of here. A lot of us work remote, so the best way to reach us is going to be through email, um, and then we can always coordinate phone calls if you're unable to reach us by phone. Um, it could be because we're out in the field or because we are, um, you know, we use our computers now as our phone, and so sometimes it, it's a little bit different as far as answering would have been when we were sitting at a desk with a, um, a hooked up phone right there. The... Division phone number is the 8869 number that you see there. You can click that and, or call that number and um, receive or ask to speak to a monitor, or you can use that 1-800 number there, um, and that's going to be the main department phone number. You'll probably leave a voicemail, and which will then be forwarded. What do we have? Can we do a test to make sure everybody can hear me? Yes. I got one that can. Testing, and testing. Yeah. Restart. I think everybody because I think okay. I'm not seeing anybody else no. come in. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, somebody else said they can hear just yeah. fine. Great. Thank you guys. Um, so the way this is going to work, we're starting now, it's 9 a.m. We're going to run until about noon. The noon time kind of depends on what questions you guys have, what resources you guys need, that sort of a thing. So um, if, we, if, if you guys get all your questions answered and it's 1130, we will wrap up at 1130. Um, but we, we do plan to be here till, till noon, so don't think you're putting us um, in a bind. <laughs> By, by asking too many questions. That's definitely not a thing. We would love for you to ask your questions, get those answered. Um, like Amy always says, if you have the question and you don't ask it, there's a good chance somebody else has the same question and now you nobody's asked it and there's folks going home um, with unanswered questions. So ask your questions, they're in, the, they're in the questions box. Amy's gonna, she'll answer some of them um, in the questions box and she will answer some of them, we'll read them out loud uh, so that the whole group can benefit from the answer. We'll take a break mid-morning, um, kind of depending on, we'll find a good stopping point and take a, take a break, a little quick break. Um, Amy and I are going to be here to present the information. You will receive a certificate for this class because it is a dedicated webinar to one topic. It is not an office hours with an open forum presentation. So if you did not use your email, the link, you will need to um, close out what whatever you're in and however you got into the webinar and use that link that you were sent, that's gonna be the only way you get the certificate. Otherwise you won't get a certificate. And unfortunately, we do not have a way to repopulate those. So you are going to um, not have that, not 
I, I don't know that you would need that for anything other than uh, to show that you attended it to maybe your, your management company or your ownership group, um, but it's still a good thing to kind of have to show that you were here with us today. I would encourage you to silence your phones and put an out of office for these few hours. Um, it is a short training, um, but we definitely want you to get the most out of it. And we feel like being fully present is probably the best way to do that. And again, you will put all of your questions in the questions box and Amy is gonna moderate that for us. So before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts, we've got some resources that we wanna share with you. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service is kind of the entity that wrote the bond program out. So that, that's where this all comes from. And it kind of mirrors the housing tax credit program in some ways, but not in all ways. Uh, 24 CFR 5.609 is going to list out the excluded incomes. That was recently updated with the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act of 2016. If you have been attending our HOTMA trainings, we started those back in September and have done different ones throughout the year, then you're going to be um, kind of on the up and up with the HOTMA changes. If you have not, I would encourage you to do that uh, before the end of the year so that for 2025, you are fully um, HOTMA compliant and fully compliant with all the new requirements. The Housing and Urban Development has is the um, entity that has developed the documentation that we use uh, to determine who counts as a household member, whose income counts, that sort of a thing, and then how to calculate income and assets. So when these um, housing programs came in that are technically tax programs, came to be, they said, wait a second, they being the IRS said, wait a second, the Housing and Urban Development Group has already done a handbook on how to calculate income, let's piggyback off of that. So we're gonna use that, which is why the HOTMA changes um, impacted how we calculate for these other programs, because we are using those resources. And you can see there, there's the HOTMA resources listed. And then HUD has also indicated as part of the HOTMA changes, that there are certain things that are going to change every year, like the threshold with which we have to impute income for assets and verify assets in intervening years, that sort of a thing. And then the passbook rate is also changing. So that bottom link is the inflationary adjustments. We also have a chart on our website that you can use, and we sent out an announcement about that um, a couple weeks ago, I think, on the 11th, I think. <clears throat> so some department resources. <clears throat> that are available to you guys. Um, we've got all our forms online. Some of them are, you know, we don't have a set required form that you have to, we don't say you have to use our form. Um, there are some required forms that you'll wanna use. If you want to take our form and create your own, that's fine. Um, you, you do have to use, you know, like an application and the asset forms and the student forms, that sort of a thing. You wanna have, make sure your file tells the whole story. And we go into detail on that. Um, with our income determination training. So you won't really get a lot of that here as far as qualifying goes, but um, we'll kind of touch on different things. Um, our manuals and rules are also listed there. And so you'll wanna be sure that you kind of stay up to date with that information. And when there are changes to the rules, we do send out listserv announcements. So if you're not signed up to receive those, I would encourage you to go to our website when you have time, scroll all the way to the bottom, click the yellow subscribe button and uh, join our email list for whatever areas you want. You can you know, just be part of certain programs if you want to, or be made aware when there's new program or new properties um, proposed for your area. There's a lot of different options that you can select there. The income and rent limits have their own section of our website. And then the online income and rent tool that we switched to this year is on that part. Um, the training and presentations are all recorded and posted online. Um, that has taken on a new look over the last month or so. Um, it's now broken into categories. This one will be recorded or is being recorded and will be posted under the compliance monitoring header. And we felt like that would just help you guys find your trainings a little bit easier instead of having to kind of search through this big long list that was continually growing. Um, our contact list is also available there that has um, all of the compliance monitors as well as all the physical inspectors. So if you can't remember you know, who it is you needed to talk to, maybe the list will jog your memory, or if you can't remember how to spell my last name, for example, you can go to that website, uh, click the link and um, get it to where it'll send me an email or it'll pull up my email address for you or my phone number. 
Um, the multifamily bond program does have their own section of the website as well. So that's going to be a resource kind of on the front end of the bond program, whereas we're on the you've already been awarded, you've got a regulatory agreement, and now we're going to we're going to monitor you and um, have the actual operations of the bond program. So we get some de definitions that I wanted to go through with you guys before we um, got into the, the regulatory agreement conversation about the bond program. One of the big things with the bond program is eligible tenant. <clears throat> and these this is sometimes shortened to ET. If you are required to have eligible tenants, you can make that election on your unit status report. Um, right, Amy, you can't, okay. Shook her head at something else. And I thought, oh no, maybe I'm giving bad information. So you can make that designation on the unit status report. And in a lot of cases, that's very important because we need to know which units are your, your specifically designated bond units and which units are your eligible tenant units. And we've got quite a few examples in here. We'll kind of look at that with, with some real examples. Um, and for this particular training, the examples that we pulled are real properties. And we, you know, we tried to hide the property information so nobody, um, you know, felt like they were getting called out because that was not the intention, but we've, we've pulled some, some real actual regulatory agreements and land use restriction agreements um, or LURAs so that we could have real information that you guys could utilize. So you can see there the definition of eligible tenants that might deviate slightly depending on what generation your regulatory agreement is, but for the most part, this is going to be the definition. Um, and the eligible tenants don't fall under the same requirements as your specific bond units. Um, so that's going to be a little where, where a little bit of that bit of that comes into to play when you're not fully 100% bond at 60% or lower designations. A low income tenant under the bond program is a tenant whose adjusted income is 60% or less of the median gross income for the area. That 60% marker is very important if you are bond layered with um, the average income set aside because those 70s and 80s are not going to qualify as low income under your bond program. So when you're layered with that program, you're going to have to do things a little bit differently as far as your tracking mechanisms to make sure that your eligible tenant units are on those 70s and 80s and that everything else under the bond program is on those 60s and less. Um, there may be other designations in your bond regulatory agreement. They are going to be property specific. And um, a, a bond regulatory agreement is going to have to be really read and scrutinized. It's not going to be like your other program ones where you can go to the back and just kind of find your chart, like in a housing tax credit LURA. You're going to have to go through your bond LURA because they are um, more, I guess, less of like a, a table where it tells you specifically what's what. Um, and we've asked if they could do that, but because of the way the bond program works and the way these regulatory agreements have to be done, that's not possible. So we, when we monitor your bond property, your bond program, we have to go through it, you know, line by line and read it kind of like a short novel. Um, and so you you want to be sure that you're you're reading through those and not just skimming those bond regulatory agreements. A person with special needs is defined a little bit differently under the bond program. This is another thing that you want to be sure that you look at the definition in your regulatory agreement because it might change based on the generation of your property or your program funding. But for the most part, this is going to be, you know, the disabled or handicapped under federal law, elderly, meaning 62 years of age or more. And then there's a little bit further into the definition that goes where you'd have to reference some other pieces of the regulatory agreement. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be those first two, which we're pretty used to seeing. So we have a disclaimer for this one. I know there's some folks from other bond issuer programs here on the training today. The bond program that we are talking about is the department's bond program. We are not qualified or the entity with um, the allowance to speak to, you know, a Travis County bond program or a South Texas bond issuer, that sort of a thing. We are only able to tell you how we're going to treat the department bond. Um, so if you have questions and you have a different bond issuer than us, please make sure that you are taking our answers kind of with a grain of salt and checking with your bond issuer. If you have department bond funds, then absolutely what we're telling you today is how we're going to monitor how you need to um, handle your bond program, that sort of a thing. But if you have 
you know, a municipality or a county bond issuer or a bank or, or a syndicator, um, you are not going to necessarily want to just run with what we're telling you today until you've confirmed with them that um, that is the, the way that they want you to handle your bonds uh, for them. So we do have a poll here. Oh, my mouse went to sleep. So our first poll is true or false, the bond program is most often layered with 9% housing tax credits. I'm going to launch this real quick. It is going to take over your screen. You can say true or false. So this was kind of written on the slide before, but I didn't really say it. So, but we'll talk about it for sure. Amy, is there anything, any questions or anything? All right, give it a couple more seconds. So it does look like most of you agree this is false, and that's correct. Bonds are most commonly layered with 4% housing tax credits, and we'll look at some 8609s to see kind of how we know what that what that is. Um, but the 8609 forms are going to tell you how much of the property was financed with aggregate bonds. And if it's 50% or more or 51% or more, then that is going to be um, something that's uh, layered with a 4% usually. So the first part of any bond program, as with any other program, is learning your regulatory agreement. So this is um, akin to the LURA that you have for other programs. In fact, I will probably call it a LURA um, accidentally or otherwise. I will do my best to continue to refer to it as the regulatory agreement, um, but it, this is your bond LURA. So if somebody asks you for that, this is what they're looking for. This is going to tell you your qualified project period and your state restrictive period. This is also going to tell you your designations with regards to income and rent, if there are rent designations. This is going to tell you your special needs requirements, your development amenities that are required, your tenant supportive services and expenditure requirements, and your initial maximum rents. The only way or the best way to be successful in managing your bond program is to be very familiar with your regulatory agreement. When, when, when I monitor a bond property, I go through with you know, I, I save a copy and I go through and I highlight the important pieces so that I can go back after I've read through the whole document, I can go back and pinpoint, okay, I need more details on this or I can take my notes on that. I'm, I'm sure all the monitors have different processes for how they do that, but these are a little more um, involved as far as where, how to get the information. So you wanna be sure that you're going through it and then make, I make those notes so that I don't have to reread the document every single time I'm um, back in it to check on something for the monitoring review. But um, you guys that are managing these are gonna have even more of a reason to highlight and note the important pieces um, because you're gonna be dealing with these a whole lot more often than what we are. So here's what a bond regulatory agreement is going to look like. And you can see it looks a little bit different. It's a little bit more of what you would expect to see. I hate to call it a legal document because the LURA is also a legal document for other programs, but this one is written more like almost a loan document, um, I think. And, and that's part of why it has to be broken down the way it has to be broken down. So you've got your cover sheet, you've got your table of contents, and then it tells you, you know, kind of who the agreement is between, when was it dated, that sort of a thing. You can also see here, there might be two different, um, two differences in your table of contents. Section five on this one has maximum allowable gross rent. Section five on this one is reserved, but is blank. So the property for this regulatory agreement on the right, where it says reserved, that one does not have rent requirements. This one does. 
Now, just because something on the table of contents says reserved, don't say, oh, that means I don't have rent requirements. I don't have to worry about that. That's not necessarily what's that, what that is saying, but you do want to kind of be aware of that. And this is an area where the table of contents can be a clue to what you're going to find of importance later on as you go through the regulatory agreement. So the qualified project period is part of the term, and then there is a state restrictive period. And you can see those are both defined. And this is kind of the general um, bond definition of these two items, but some of them, I looked at one yesterday that has a 35 year term instead of a 30 year term. So you do wanna be sure that you are referencing your specific bond regulatory agreement. So the qualified project period, is 15 years after the date on which 50% of the units in the development are occupied or the first date on which no tax exempt private activity bond issued with respect to the development is outstanding for federal income tax purposes or the date on which any assistance provided with respect to the development under section eight of the Housing Act terminates. We do have a monitor, his name is Charles Stites. If you have questions about when these things end for your bond program, you can email um, him. But a lot of times what we see is that 15 year mark um, or, or when they're paid off, when the bonds are paid off, but the state restrictive period, which for this one is a term of 30 years after the first day, which runs concurrently with the qualified project period. So no matter what, no matter when the bonds are paid off, no matter any of those other stipulations, the state restrictive period is still gonna run for 30 years. So you're still gonna have to meet all of those um, items in the regulatory agreement for 30 years and it may be longer than 30 years from the start because if there's a delay in paying off the bonds or if there's another issue that prevents the end of the bond term it it would continue to go um, past that 30-year mark So for this example, you can see in section two, the tax exempt status of the bond shows that it's going to be a qualified residential project with the meaning of 142D of the code. And that's gonna be the case through the qualified project period. So that might change once it becomes a, once the qualified project period is satisfied and it goes into the state restrictive period. But that 142D of the code is where it says that 40% of all units are going to be restricted at 60% area median income under the bond program. So that's what we know for this specific bond regulatory agreement. Now there might be other requirements as we go a little bit further, but for sure we know 40% of our units will be bond restricted at 60%. So this would be an instance where when we come out to your 100 unit bond property, we would expect to see 40 with designations at 60, and 60 units with designations as ET under that bond program. You can see here, it goes a little bit further. It tells you under letter V that each unit will be rented or available for rental basis or rental on a continuous basis by an eligible tenant. So that other 60% of the units, depending on what, you, what the rest of your bond Lura says, is going to be eligible tenants. So you're gonna have to meet that requirement. Then you read a little bit further and then it says continuously during the qualified project period, um, at least 40% of the available units are to be held vacant and, av and available for occupancy by low income tenants. So that just further solidifies that this bond property has got 40% of the units at 60% AMI under the bond program. The rest of the units are gonna be eligible tenants. Eligible tenants don't have annual recertification requirements, but the 40% under that program are gonna have uh, some recertification requirements depending on how the programs are layered. Anything you wanna add on this slide? Um, we go deeper into eligible tenants, don't we? I think so. I, if not, we will. Yeah, if not, we will. We'll, we'll talk about eligible tenants kind of throughout the, the whole morning. Um, so hopefully it helps answer those questions, but we can definitely dig in if that's not clear by the end.
And this would be an instance where you'd want to go back and reference your eligible tenant definition in your bond regulatory agreement so that you can be sure that your eligible tenants meet that requirement. Now we've got our state restrictive period. And we can see here that 100% of our units are reserved for eligible tenants. But 50% of the units are reserved for tenants whose combined annual income is not more than 50%. And the remaining 50% of units are uh, reserved for households where they are at the 60% limit. So even though that sentence about eligible tenants is there, that's not going to be as impactful for this because we can see then that half of our units are 50% and half of our units are 60%. So the eligible tenant piece is kind of a backseat to this because we've got 100% of our units rent income restricted under the bond program at lower designations. But a different way that might be worded is this one that you see in the one that just popped up where it says 100% of the occupied tenant units are occupied at all times by eligible tenants. That still means that you've got to have 40% of your units that are bond restricted at 60% and the rest would be eligible tenants. There's a caveat in here in that same land use restriction agreement that says, oh, let me go back. So in this one that you can see up there where it says 40%, but 100% are eligible tenants. When you look at that one, it's going to tell you that the bond program has to be met and the, and the, the code is that 40% of the units are 60% or less. Here's another example that you can see there highlighted in yellow. This one says that 100% of the units are eligible tenants, but 80% of those are rent income restricted at 60%. So this one, you're gonna have 80% of your units at 60% and the other 20% of your units will be eligible tenants. So these are three different examples that you might see in your bond regulatory agreement and it does like i said you've got to read through it and kind of go through and when when the bond regulatory agreement references but you've got to go back and we're going to look at that with that second example um here and just i think it's maybe the next slide even you've got to go back and reference those extra pieces you you want to be sure that you are looking at the details um because every bond agreement is a little bit different so this is kind of the same example we had just a second ago, where it's 100% of the units are eligible tenants, but you've got to make sure that sections 2A5, 2B1, and 2B6 are still met. And those are, so here's five from 2A, that each dwelling is rented on a continuous basis to eligible tenants. The owner is not going to give preference in renting project dwelling units to any particular class or group of persons other than low income tenants and other eligible tenants as provided herein. And at no time will any portion of the project be exclusively reserved for use by a limited number of non-exempt persons in their trades or businesses. So that is saying that you cannot during the state restrictive period change what the intention of the property and program was, that you are going to continue to keep that as a low income property. The other section in 2B1 tells you that 40% of the units have to be low income units. So for this one, it's 100% bond, but only 40% of the units have to be at 60%. The rest can be at um, the eligible tenant status. So that kind of gets us the details from that additional piece. Amy, did you have anything you want to add on this slide? Okay. We wanted to be sure that everybody understood that even during the state restrictive period, it's like other programs, those designation pieces don't go away. Sometimes they change, but they don't go away. And you want to be sure that you are still treating this as a low income uh, development using the appropriate restrictions and um, eligible tenant designations. So the bond available unit rule is similar to the way it's run with tax credit, but it outlines it in the land use restriction agreement. 
So if it's layered with the housing tax credit program that is within the federal compliance period, then you will follow the um, housing tax credit available unit rule. If the property has gone post 15 under the tax credit program, then the available unit rule is property wide. It's still gonna be that 140% threshold, um, but for bond, it's property wide unless they're layered with tax credit, right? Okay. So if you are bond only, your available unit rule has to be followed for your whole property because bond doesn't do projects um, like the way the housing tax credit program does. And, oh, that's right. I said, this one always gets me hung up. <laughs> it's a building rule. For the tax credit program, it's a building rule. And when you're not layered with tax credit and you have bonds, it becomes a development wide. Okay, that's it. That's why we keep Amy around because she helps me when I get tongue tied. So it's a building rule. The available unit rule is a building rule, just like it would be with tax credit, unless you're layered with tax credit and has gone post 15, right? Say that backwards if you're, again. Yeah, he said it backwards again. <laughs> if you're layered with tax credit the, and you have bonds, the available unit rule for your bonds follows the tax credit and becomes a building rule. So it becomes a building rule. If yes. you do not have tax credits or your tax credits are past the federal compliance period, then the available unit rule follows the bond, which is development-wide. Okay. Yes. Thank you. This one always gets me twisted. <laughs> so if they have questions, they can put in the chat since yes, I mixed I'll that one up. That yes. <laughs> okay. So the next piece is going to be the rent designations that are in the regulatory agreement. You can see on the first one that it tells us 50% of the bond units will be rent restricted at 50% limits, and the remaining 50% of units will be restricted at 60% limits. And then you can see in the other example, or in the rest of that, I think these are from the same, yes, these are from the same one, that during the state restrictive period, everything goes to the 60% limit. So depending on how your, how your document reads, you may have a change in this. It may stay the same, but it might change to where during the state restrictive period, it, it changes to where everything's at 60% or where all the rents are at 60% or all the rents are at 50%. So you wanna be sure that you are referencing that information and making sure that you're not just assuming that the rent designation will follow the income designation because we do see um, like with that bottom one that's at the letter B, the um, state restrictive period where all units are restricted at 60% limits, maybe only 40% of the units are restricted at the income limit and not at the full, um, not the full property is income restricted. So you would have your only a certain percentage restricted with regards to income, but the whole property would be restricted with regards to the rent limit. And they, I think they want you to re-talk about the available unit rule. Can we put the slide back up? They just okay. Me slide. okay. So again, on the table of contents, we have a section that has rents in it. And then we have a section that says reserves. So that if we cannot find rent limits, we've read our regulatory agreement and we cannot find rent limits. And then we go back to our table of contents and it has this reserved on it. We probably don't have rent limits. So we're not just um, losing track of what we're reading. We are we don't have rent limits. Whereas this one, if we can't find the rent limits listed, we need to reference back to section five so that we can be sure that we have uh, the right rent limits designated for our program. The next piece of information that's in the regulatory agreement is the persons with special needs requirement. And this one you can see requires that 5% of the units within the development are available for occupancy with by persons with special needs. And then we've got the special needs definition there from that same regulatory agreement. So you would wanna be sure that your unit status report out of all the units, if you've got a hundred units, you wanna make sure that five of those are designated as special needs under the bond program so that you can meet that requirement. The next piece that's in your regulatory agreement are going to be the tenant supportive services. 
And there are two generations of the uh, LORA that you might have or of the regulatory agreement. The one you see on the left where it's got the points values and it tells you you've got to have at least eight points, that's a newer bond regulatory agreement. Whereas the one on the right is an older generation one. Um, and I want to say the newer one kind of came in in the last couple of years. So you probably are going to be seeing more of what the one on the right looks like, where it tells you what you've got to choose from, how, and then kind of all the meat and potatoes about how your supportive services and how they're going to be reviewed. We've done an in-depth supportive services training. So if you have questions on how that works, you're going to want to review that as well. But for this one, if you're layered with something else, they should be able to align. If you're not layered, you just have bond, you will want to um, make sure that you are offering the services that are listed there on that bond list and meeting those requirements just as you would with any other program. You also wanna keep in mind that your bond supportive services don't end. So I know for those of you that have housing tax credits layered, then going post 15 makes sense to you. But if you're just bond, you don't ever go post 15. There's no end. The, the whole term of the LURA is the term that um, you have to offer supportive services. So if you are layered with the housing tax credit program and your housing tax credit program only has to do services for the first 15 years and then your bond program has to continue, make sure that your on-site staff is aware of that so that they can continue with the on-site supportive services. There are land use or regulatory agreements under the bond program that require um, an expenditure where the owner has to spend a certain amount per unit. So we can see here that the tenant supportive services are in, outlined in exhibit C. So we've got our exhibit C. And then that last sentence, the owner will expend at least $10 per unit per month on services to be provided to tenants at the development. So we wanna be sure that we are keeping track of that, that we've got an invoice for that, and that when, the, when we at the state are, a, are coming to do a monitoring review, that you're able to provide that expenditure documentation as well as the backup to the um, services that you've offered, like your sign-in sheets and your flyers and that sort of a thing. But there are regulatory agreements that do not have an expenditure requirement. You can see here, this paragraph talks about the services in Exhibit C, and it says the borrower must um, provide the social services throughout the state's restrictive period, so it's through the whole term. But there's no sentence about how much money that owner has to spend. So for that one, there is no expenditure requirement. But for the other one, there is. There any questions? Okay. So the next thing that's listed is the development amenities. And this is something that's going to be looked at during the um, physical inspection side. And you can see there that it's got to include at least 18 points selected. You're going to want to know what your owner elected during the application process so that you can make sure that those amenities are maintained. So if your owner said when they got their bond funding that they were going to be sure they had a swimming pool at all times, you want to be sure that you don't fill the swimming pool in and make a garden because now you're going to not have enough points on this community amenities um, and you're going to have to either replace the swimming pool with something or put back the swimming pool and um, because during physical inspections they're going to look for those 18 points the next thing that's listed in exhibit d are going to be the maximum rents at initial. So this is saying that at the very beginning of the bond program, you've got this much in rent that you're going to charge or that you will have to charge. So these are the maximums. And this tells you when it was when it was set up, what the limits were at the two, three, four bedroom for the 50% limit and the 60% limit. But this tells you kind of where the where the program started. So this gives you that rent floor. All right, so we have another poll here. And this is a good time to think through questions that you want to type in so that we can keep answering those questions. Bond developments are always 100% income and rent restricted at 60% of the area median income. 
yes always, no never, or sometimes it depends on the LURA or the regulatory agreement. <coughs> Thank you guys for participating in the poll. That helps me know if you're, if I'm explaining things right. Got a couple more seconds, we'll leave this open. So most of you answered that the answer was C, and that is correct. Remember I said the regulatory agreement is going to tell you what restrictions you have, and the bond regulatory agreements are going to have a section about income restrictions and a section about rent restrictions. So they're not necessarily always going to be the same for all your units. Are there any questions or anything you wanna add before we talk about monitoring reviews for the bond? No, we're in black box. Okay. Perfect. Yes, I know for sure. Uh, so, with regards to monitoring reviews, that's kind of the bigger piece of the puzzle. I know that's why um, a lot of you are here today because you want to ask questions about this process. When you log into CMTS or the Compliance Monitoring and Tracking System, that's the system that we use to know how to call your property what address to use when we're coming out to monitor, who's the on-site manager, that sort of a thing. So we wanna be sure that that information is updated and current, because if we call to ask a question and we say, oh, can I speak with Karen, who's listed as the manager in CMTS, and they say, oh, Karen hasn't been here for three years. And we say, well, then we need to talk to the property manager and, you know, we make a little note that that's not correct in CMTS and we, you know, let the manager know when we talk to them that they need to, you know, speak to their compliance folks and get that updated. The other reason CMTS is important is that's our form of communication with you guys. We don't mail letters out. We don't email correspondence. We upload into the CMTS attachment system and that then notifies the email addresses that are connected to that property. And there's a way to put an email address for the property, for the management company, and for the ownership. And that's up to the property ownership as who gets what email is listed. We would encourage you to have three different people listed so that if one person goes on vacation, everybody is still notified accordingly and it's not something that gets lost in the uh, time that that other person is off. Um, there is a way to do an umbrella email, but you want to be sure that the ownership is receiving those or that the ownership is a separately listed email address and maybe the umbrella email goes with the management company. I would encourage ownership and management to verify through CMTS that that they that somebody's checking it in the attachment system so that uh, documents that we upload are not missed. Um, a, the whole department uses CMTS, so not just us. So sometimes stuff comes up there from asset management or from the fair housing division or from our complaints group. So it, it's not just going to be every three years that you're going to have a monitoring review. You need to pay attention to this because this is where um, a lot of communication happens. Um, the reason the owner needs to be specifically listed is because they're the ones that would be um, subject to the administrative penalties or debarment requirements if the property fails to comply, because it is the owner's responsibility to comply with the requirements of the program. The, the way the monitoring review is going to work, the lead monitor is going to upload a notification into the CMTS attachment system. That notification is gonna tell you the date and time that monitors will be at the development. That is an estimate and it will say that in the letter. It will say approximately 10 a.m. on November 13th, monitors will be at this property to conduct a review. 
if it's if we've got other reviews ahead of yours and they go well maybe we're going to come earlier if they don't go well or traffic is bad or you're i'm one of the monitors and i got hungry and drove past a burger king i'm going to have to stop and get a whopper and that might delay me so i might be there at 11 15 especially if it's whopper wednesday but that's tomorrow guys that's not today um amy thinks it's hilarious that i'm the only person in america that just absolutely loves burger king <laughs> The notification is also going to tell you the due date for the unit status report and the uh, monitor review questionnaire. And it's also going to tell you when the um, occupancy data should be through. So usually those are about a week after the notification is uploaded. We do take into account holidays uh, where we are closed. <laughs> but we, you do want to read through those and make sure that you are looking at those dates and calendaring those dates. Also, the monitor review questionnaire tells you what needs to be uploaded in addition to completing the two reports. You wanna be sure that you are reading the um, monitor review questionnaire in detail and before you hit submit at the very end, it's gonna tell you what you need to upload or you can highlight and make a list as you go through it. We have a detailed training um, on the monitor review questionnaire and i think that just got revised recently right it did, it did. and we have to do another we have one. to do another one where amy's going to walk through it and go step by step we're going to actually complete um a questionnaire maybe that'll be our december office hours so when you when you upload your pre-on-site documentation so that's the stuff that the monitor review questionnaire asked you for you want to um do that in a, a time efficient manner and put it in a way that we can understand um, so that we can then prepare for the review, whether it's a desk or an on-site review. We will, we will do as much prep before as we can. Um, sometimes due to other job responsibilities, we might not be able to finish that part. You know, maybe we have to look at your supportive services after we come back or something like that. But we do, um, we try to prepare before we come out so that we can have a good picture of what we're looking for at the review. Um, after the review and after we finish all of the kind of behind the scenes preparations like the supportive services, and if you're layered with other programs, you might have other requirements. Um, so you, we will then issue a monitoring report, which will detail any issues of non-compliance, um, any issues of um, past non-compliance, any items of technical assistance that we feel would benefit the property or the ownership or management group. So that is um, an important piece to read through. That monitoring report is also going to give you a 90-day corrective action period if you have um, non-compliance that needs to be addressed. If you don't have non-compliance, then there won't be a corrective action period. The corrective action period can be extended for up to 90 days, but you do have to make that request. Um, there's an email address listed in the uh, letter that in the monitoring report that you would email for the extension request. And then once you get that approved, that's when you would know, don't wait till day 89 to request the extension. If you're working on your corrective action and you realize, oh no, we've got an ineligible household and we need to have them move out first before we can correct this issue of non-compliance, you need to email then. That way, we you've got your time to know, did it get approved? You've got to give us a plan, kind of what's going to happen. Before, when you get the notification of the on-site monitoring review, make sure your on-site staff is aware that we're coming. Um, I think all of us at this point have shown up to a property where the staff said, wait a second, we didn't know you were coming. I, in fact, had a staff ask me if I could go somewhere else. But unfortunately, when we're in Canadian Texas and you are the one affordable housing property in the town, we can't go anywhere else. We, we wouldn't really be able to do that anyway. But the staff has to be aware that we're coming so that they know that there's going to be some expectations for them to be able to pull files for us and you know have the lights on so that we can monitor those tenant files. You also want to be aware that if, if we send you a letter that says, hey, we're going to be there. Oh, that just went to, <laughs> um, that we're gonna be there during a week. If you are one of the companies that has a requirement for somebody from your compliance group to be there, you may wanna plan for them to be around that whole week or at least the Tuesday to Friday of the week because we're gonna be in that area for the week. So just because your property has a specific day and time that's estimated, we probably have you know a, 
I think most of our trips have five, six, some of them have as many as like 12 or 13, depending on the size of the trip and the area. So you wanna be sure that you, if you've got a requirement for somebody to be on site, that you guys have that person in the area kind of for that week um, and are aware that the, the time may change. Cause if we get way ahead, we're gonna call you and say, hey, we're gonna be here today instead of tomorrow. Um, we are working on, you know, taxpayer dollars. And so we do try to, to move things up if we can. We are a, gov a state government entity and we wanna be as efficient and effective as we can when we're out in the field. So during the actual review, if it's a desk monitoring review, you're gonna to be told, hey, we're gonna look at um, 13 files. You'll have 24 hours to upload those files. Please let the monitor know immediately if that's gonna be an issue. Well, if that's not gonna be an issue, then when, on the date that was indicated, you'll get a letter that says, hey, you've got 24 hours, please upload these 13 files. Then the monitor would expect to see the 13 files within that time frame and we would review them um, from our desk versus from the, the property. If, you're, uh, if we are coming out to do an on-site review, we will need an area where we can set up our laptops. We need to have outlets that work. We need to have tables, we need to have chairs. That way we can um, review the files in, in a, a way that, that works. It's, it's hard to review files from the floor and from our lap. Um, but if that's what you got, then we'll work with it. While the monitors are setting their stuff up to do the review, you would want to be sure that your staff is pulling files. So um, in theory, that should all kind of happen concurrently. And then when we sit down to get ready to review files, we like to already have you know, a handful. So if it's, you know, if, if we've got a 25 file review, if you can bring us the first stack, we can get started while your staff is continued, continuing to pull the remainder of the files. Um, we will review the files, and then if we have any technical assistance that would benefit staff on site, we might share that with them then. Um, we might conduct an exit interview, but sometimes we, we don't have anything really to include in an exit interview. So we're going to say, hey, thank you for your time. Um, we'll get a monitoring report out in about 30 days, and then you, know, you can reach out to the monitor after that fact to um, have a detailed exit interview if that's something you would like. Some monitors sit down and go over a little bit more. That's at the monitor's discretion. Sometimes that depends on how far ahead in our schedule we are or how far behind we are. So that might change based on the monitor or based on kind of the nature of the trip. Is there anything you want to add or any questions? Before there we... is some questions okay. um, that I think are good. Um, one says, if you are monitoring a 100% tax credit community and they have bonds from another entity, do you monitor the non-TDHCA bonds? And the answer is no, we do not. We only monitor for funding that has been awarded or issued or distributed by the department. So only department programs are monitored by department compliance staff. So if you have bonds from another entity, um, a couple of things to know. They should not, you'll probably get technical assistance if they are on your unit status report. They should not be. That is a TDHCA report and should only be reporting TDHCA funds. Um, and if they are indicated as additional funding on your income certification. So on page two, where you tell us what type of funding that is, again, that is our document and should reflect our funds and not your other entity's funds. That is between you and them, how your file must look for them. That is not between us. Um, the next one is, how can I check for certain to confirm there is a requirement to have a compliance staff present at the monitoring review? That is not a requirement. That, there are, I think they got there are companies and I only know this because they call us. There, there are companies that require someone from their staff to be present when we do a monitoring review. We don't care if we show up and your maintenance guy hands us the tenant files. We don't have a requirement for that at all. Um, so this one is, what about bonds issued by PFCs? Um, we monitor the PFCs under a different monitoring regulation than um, subchapter F, so we are required to receive audit documentations from those PFCs, and um, for more information on that, please reach out to me privately, and I'd be happy to go over to that, over those, and yes, HOTMA does apply to the PFCs, just a um, just side note, share that as well, um, but that is a different monitoring regulation than um, subchapter F. 
<laughs> and then the next question we have is we do we always third party verify assets for bonds i think you're going to get into yeah. this in just a little bit so we'll let kara get into that in the next couple of slides um, and we go over our assets on that and that is it for questions for now okay so after the monitoring review, we're going to come back, we're going to look at all the checklists, we're going to go through our documentation that we use to conduct the review to make sure we've, we've looked at all the things we're supposed to look at and all the checklists are complete, and we're going to issue the monitoring report. You're either going to get, uh, there were no issues of non-compliance, or there were issues of non-compliance report, and there might be technical assistance in either of those reports. So if there are no issues of non-compliance, we're going to thank you for your time, tell you what files we looked at, outline any technical assistance that might be helpful, <coughs> and we're gonna close the review. If there were events of non-compliance, we're gonna tell you what those events of non-compliance were, and then we're gonna attach a detailed non-compliance report so that you can see the unit number that was impacted if it was a unit issue. You can see the issue of non-compliance and the detailed corrective action required. I would encourage you to read through the entire monitoring report, I know they all look the same, but they are different based on the nature of the review and of, the, of what's going on at the property. So if we have three reviews for the same management company or the same ownership group, ownership group during a week, we might have similar monitoring reports, um, but they might all be a little bit different based on what we saw at the review. If the owner or the owner's representative or management company has questions about the monitoring report, that would be the time to reach out to the monitor and say, hey, can we set up a call? Um, we've looked at this. We've got a couple questions. Sometimes you won't have any questions after you look at it because they're clear and concise and, and the questions are answered in the monitoring report. Um, if you wanted a detailed exit interview, this would be the time to have it because now everything's done from the review. You've seen the report. Now you can ask those questions and the monitor can further expand on technical assistance items if needed um, or on uh, issues of non-compliance if needed. Some reasons for technical assistance are gonna be changes to the program rules or requirements. So if you've gotten a letter in 2024, you've had a blurb about how the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act has gone in place and that we've done trainings and here's how to find those trainings. That's been in, I think, every monitoring report we've issued this year. There have also been some changes to the 811 program, and that's been in our technical assistance. Um, there could also be things that we've had to cite as non-compliance that are going to be more detailed in the technical assistance piece. And then there, um, there might be imperfect documentation that we want to say, hey, here's what we observed while we were here. In the future, this may result in non-compliance. Please, please correct accordingly. Um, it might be that something, you know, maybe the rights and resources guide was missing in one unit and you, we looked at 52 units and the others had it. So maybe maybe we opt to just give technical assistance on that one, um, you know, different things like that. The, the monitor has discretion to include things that they think would benefit the management ownership and onsite group during that technical assistance section of the letter. So that is truly where it's kind of like a conversation piece where the monitor can share their observations that would help for future reviews. There is a timeline. We issue our monitoring letter within 30 days of the review. It's going to tell you if there are issues of non-compliance. It will explain the specific type of non-compliance and the corrective action required to fix it. The corrective action period will be 90 days and it can be extended for an additional 90 days for a total of six months for good cause, but approval is needed for that. So you can't just say, oh, I, I want an extra 60 days. I'm going to um, you know, have that included here or whatever. You, you've got to request that, that extra uh, corrective action period. I don't know why that's not quite real time. So how to submit corrective action? You will upload this into the development um, CMTS attachment system. It has to be completed and uploaded before the end of the 90 day period unless an extension is granted. We would encourage you to include a dated cover letter that tells us kind of what you uploaded, what it 
what it does kind of gives us the background. Sometimes you have to submit a unit status report as part of your corrective action. There's no way to resubmit that. So you need a dated cover letter uploaded to tell us that you submitted that corrective action, you've updated your unit status report, and here it is uh, you know, for department review. There's a, a little, that last bullet um, there in the little section is about how to upload into CMTS. For the most part, I think you guys have that, but that is there as a resource. Failure to submit complete and satisfactory corrections um, on or before the corrective action deadline will result in a referral to the, to the department's enforcement committee. So if you don't submit at all, then that's an automatic referral. If you only submit for two things and you had 10 things, those eight things that you didn't submit on are gonna be referred because they weren't addressed during the corrective action window. If 90 days and an extension are not enough, you would need to upload a detailed corrective action plan. You need to tell us, hey, this household's lease is not up until the end of March. We need to give them a, a 60 day notice of non-renewal because of whatever, maybe they were never, they were never income eligible. Um, that sort of a thing, and you you need to be able to tell us that you're gonna you're gonna send them that you're gonna then need 30 days to make the unit ready and get it leased, and so you plan to have a household in occupancy by May 1st, for example. And so you want to be sure that you are sending us a detailed corrective action plan for this, and that needs to be uploaded within your corrective action window. That will stop a referral from happening, but it will not stop Forms 8823 if you are layered with housing tax credits. So if you are a tax credit community with bond and you have non-compliance under that tax credit program that's not corrected, um, you would still get an 8823, but you would not get referred. Some non-compliance is just gonna impact the bond program or just gonna impact the housing tax credit program. So you wanna be sure that you are paying attention to that because it may change how your item has to be corrected. And it may mean that you have to fix the same thing um, in two different ways because, you know, like for a gross rent issue, it's gonna be one way for a housing tax credit program and a different way for a bond program. So you're gonna to wanna to be sure that you're paying attention to that corrective action as well as the program type and the specific requirements. So here's kind of a, a flow chart to show the timeline. We've issued our monitoring letter. There were no issues of non-compliance. We've closed the review. It ends there. We'll see in three years. If we issue the monitoring letter and there are issues of non-compliance, we'll explain them. We'll tell you the corrective action period. You can request the extension there. You can see that at that compliance.extensionrequest at tdhca.texas.gov. That has to be for good cause. You've got to tell us what is causing the delay. Why can you not get the um, corrective action uploaded within the 90 days? And then that, that extension will be logged in CMTS and uploaded um, so that we know as monitors, oh, they didn't miss the deadline, it got extended. For, with regards to monitoring reviews and corrective action, communication is key. You want to make sure that CMTS has current and correct contact information. If something changes for your development, be that a person, a phone number, an address, a manager, an ownership contact, any of that, you have 10 days from the date of the change to get CMTS updated. And that is in an effort to make sure that we have the most current information to contact the property that we need. You want to be sure you're asking questions when you're given the opportunity to. So if a monitor's on site and they say, do you have any questions for me? If you have questions, ask them. If the monitor doesn't have time to answer all of your questions, they'll say, hey, let's chat. Let's chat when I get back to the office. Here's my card or here's my phone number or send me an email. Um, we are all here to help and we want everybody to be successful. And so some of that is having that clean line of communication to answer those questions. Um, you also want to contact the monitor when the monitoring report is issued so that you can get your questions answered then. Um, if I issue a monitoring report, you're not going to necessarily want to call uh, Carolyn with questions about my monitoring report. You're probably going to want to talk to me first. Um, and then we can go through it and answer any questions. And then if there are further questions or if we don't agree or something like that, we can always loop Amy or Wendy in um, to, to help with resolution. You want to make sure you read the monitoring report and detailed non-compliance carefully so that you can be aware of the specifics. Use a highlighter, take notes, whatever works for you. You want to be sure that you are reading through that and getting all the, the pieces put together. 
You want to respond as requested. That 90-day corrective action period is set. It is unless you get an approved extension, that does not change. Um, we would also encourage you to, as an owner or a compliance division, review the corrective action before an on-site manager or on-site staff submits that. Sometimes we see imperfect submissions because an on-site manager, um, in an effort to be super helpful, went ahead and submitted a tenant file, but maybe it was missing things or maybe it wasn't fully uh, compliant and the review by an owner or a compliance person might have caught that and fixed that. So like I said, if you've got questions about the monitoring review, contact the monitor. And then if you and the monitor still can't come to a realization or to an agreement, you could then contact the um, manager or director. I'm gonna hide this, I apologize. It is not, I don't know how to hide that. I'm gonna move this up just a little bit. Okay. Sorry, that was bothering me because I feel like y'all can't see the captioning if you need it. If you have specific questions about what, uh, what's included as income or assets or inclusions or exclusions, and we are not sure of the answer, we will reach out to the National Center for Housing Management uh, to get assistance on that, that, and we save those emails. So sometimes one of you asks a question and then a, another person has the same question, you know, 10 days later, that's kind of the trend that we see. Um, and so then we've got the answer because we've already asked. We, we don't know everything. So we definitely sometimes have to reach out for a second opinion, but we can do that. So if you're not sure and you can't find the backup, you can always reach out with a question. I think Amy has put our email addresses in the chat as well. So we've got another poll here. How often are bond developments monitored by the department? Two years, three years, or five years? And I've kind of mentioned this, but I didn't specifically say da, 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 every such and such year we will be there. Let's see who else will listen. Okay. Are there any questions while the poll is up? No. Okay. about half of you that have answered the poll. Give it a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to close the poll. Looks like almost all of you agree that this is every three years. That is correct. Um, at one point, we were doing them every two years. We got some insight that that did not need to happen. We could do every three years. And if you are layered with a housing tax credit program that is completed the federal compliance period, we are still going to come every three years because of the bond funding. We will not shift to a five-year rotation for that. The corrective action period is six months, true or false? I'll answer this one quick. All right, I'm gonna close this one. Almost all of you, in fact, 96% of you agree that this is false. The corrective action period initially is 90 days. And then if you make a request and it's approved, you can get an additional 90 days. But initially, it is 90 days of a corrective action period, not six months. Are there any questions or anything you want to touch on about monitoring reviews before we do the compliance and file requirements? Mm -hmm. All right. 
So the rent and designation requirements in a tenant file, the household's lowest designation as recorded on the income certification at the time of move-in cannot be increased unless the household was found to never have income qualified for the unit, no longer income qualifies for the unit or program rules required the change. Owners are not permitted to increase the household portion of rent more than once in a 12 month period. So if they moved in in July and you do your rent increases at renewal, so the next July you do a rent increase and then your utility allowance changes in December, you can't do a rent increase in December. You've got to wait till the next July. So you want to be sure that you are tracking that and that's going to be specific to each household um, because that's not really a property thing. That's kind of, an, we, we would look at the ledgers for each household if this were an issue. If an owner is increasing a household's rent $75 or more per month, then the owner is required to provide a 75 day notice of such increase. <laughs> Unless it is governed by a, a, a program, a federal housing program that requires the change. If an owner uh, does not provide that 75 day notice, then there would have to be a refund or credit to the affected household. And there's some requirements that go along with that. You've got to tell the household, hey, we accidentally increased your rent too much. Here's what it should have been. Um, how do you want your refund? Do you want it in a credit? Do you want to check? That sort of a thing. But that has to be submitted as part of the corrective action. If you don't give them the choice between a refund or a credit, then it's automatically going to default to a check that would get sent back to them. Um, a piece of information I would like to share with you all on this slide specifically is your tenants have become very savvy. They are attending the trainings. They are watching our trainings online. They have been reading the TINTAC. Um, a lot of the calls that we get, I know Amy and I have talked about this from complainants, they've read the rules. They know. So if you've raised their rent twice in a 12-month period, they know that's not allowed and they're calling us. So be sure that you're being fully transparent with your tenants. Um, they are they are they are just aware of what's going on in the world and what the requirements are. They've taken an interest in their housing situation and they've learned the program in some cases. And so, if you are you know if you need to raise the rent, you need to follow the rules and the requirements. Um, and please don't tell them that TDHCA made you raise the rent because that makes them call us angry. Um, and then we have to kind of explain from the start how that works. The next piece that's required for compliance is a written policies and procedures. These are periodically reviewed by the Fair Housing Group here at the department. They can be reviewed as a result of complaints or the owner can initiate a review of these. If the owner would like to initiate the review, they can do so by emailing fair.housing at tdhca.texas.gov to initiate the process. You want to be sure that you are maintaining your current tenant selection criteria and all past ones so that if there is a complaint and somebody moved in two years ago, you can provide us with the tenant selection criteria under which they were originally approved if that um, is a necessity of the complaint. If the Fair Housing Division requests this from you in your CMTS attachment system, please uh, respond to them just as you would if it was a compliance monitor. They, these um, are important and if they don't get responded to, it can result in referrals, um, that sort of a thing. So you wanna be sure that you are treating their requests the same way you would treat one of ours for a monitoring review. Same goes for affirmative marketing requirements. The purpose of affirmative marketing is to be sure that persons least likely to apply are marketed to and persons with disabilities are continually marketed to. The uh, marketing efforts must begin 90 days prior to the first building being placed in service. You have to update the marketing plan every five years. You conduct outreach marketing annually unless the wait list is closed. You can find more information on that Fair Housing link that's in the last little blue bubble. Or you can call or email the Fair Housing folks at fair.housing at tdhca.texas.gov. They also are the group that would do the review of these, would request information, um, or if you wanted to have them review your plan, you would reach out to them for that. 
The application has no required form, but it is, you do have to have an application that screens for all sources of income and assets. It must also screen for, mem for all members of the household for student status. It has to provide a space for applicants to indicate if they're a veteran, and it has to include this veteran statement. We, that became a requirement in January of 2021. Um, that is now an issue of non-compliance if it's not adhered to, but thankfully lots of folks are, you, you guys have all mostly got this on your application. If you're using our application or the Texas Department Association application along with the supplement, you are um, complying with that because those, the current versions of those do have that, um, do have that listed on there. Electronics applications are acceptable, but you want to be sure that it's the same as if they were coming in. So you give all your applicants their application packet, they complete them, um, and then they would have access to the same forms, the same tenant selection criteria, the rights and resources guide, all those pieces that go into the application process would be available um, even if they're doing electronic applications. You also wanna make sure that you have some checks and balances in place to make sure that you are mitigating fraud, waste, and abuse. And that is gonna be something that is the ownership's responsibility to review. Um, the same as you would somebody bringing you in paperwork. You wanna make sure that you're looking at it to make sure it's an, um, a, a form that is you know, accurate and has not been fraudulently completed. So we had a question earlier about the asset requirements. I want you all to remember this is a bond training. So everything here is geared for the bond program. So HOTMA requires that the housing, uh, that all households have assets fully verified once during each three years of tenancies, and then a household may self-certify assets if they are under the threshold outlined by HUD, um, which right now is 50,000, but for 2025, it's going to be 51,600. Uh, so as of January 1, that does shift. You want to be sure that you are following this for your bond program. Bond requires that initially all assets are verified by firsthand or third party documentation. And then during, during at least once of every three years of tenancy that the assets are verified. So you want to be sure if you've got a household moving in next week, you want to be sure that you have done a third party or firsthand verification of their assets. And then um, you'd be okay for 25 and 26, but at least in 27, you when you if you have to do a full recertification, you would want to be um, fully verifying those assets at that time. There are some exceptions to that rule um, for housing tax credit exchange, TCAP, and state housing trust funds. You can self-certify assets. Multifamily direct loan programs require initial certification, like the bond program. But instead of the three years of tenancy, they do a full certification every sixth year of the affordability period, and they would have to be verified again at that time. All assets can now be verified using one statement, so you no longer have to do the six-month average for checking accounts. You can just get the current bank statement. And when we say current, we don't mean they're applying today and you got their July statement because that's what they had on their person. If they're applying today, you need to get the statement that most recently closed on that bank account. So their current statement, current pay stubs, that sort of a thing. Um, like I mentioned earlier in the webinar, HUD has indicated that they've got some inflationary adjustments they're gonna look at annually. Those are listed online um, as well as the chart that we have done. Um, if you can't find that chart, please feel free to send me an email and I can direct you to it. Um, you can all also go to our website and in the search box put inflation chart, and I think that will take you to it, but it is on the forms website for our section, and then it is also under the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act training that we did on Friday. It is part of that handout package. So what this looks like in a bond program unit. We've got a household that moves in or certifies May 1st, 2024. All assets are fully verified then. 25 and 26, they've self-certified because they're under the asset limitation amount. 27, we're going to fully verify again. 28 and 29, they can self-certify. 2030, they have to verify all assets again. Now, say in 2026, the property said, oops, we verified. Then in 27 and 28, you don't have to, but you would need to in 29 because now you're in your three years of tenancy. 
If the development is able to utilize annual data collection, you do not have to do this because you're not doing a full income certification. You still have to verify at initial move-in, but you would not have the every three year requirement. So if you've got 100% um, housing tax credit at 60% or less, you are, you are grandfathered in with the bond program and the housing tax credit, you can use that um, annual eligibility certification or AEC, which some people call the short research, but you can then do the recertification that way. Here's another example. We had a household that moved in in 2020. So in 24, and if you didn't do this in 24, change the date to 25, make sure you get everybody verified if you've got to do full income certifications for your bond program. Fully verify all assets in 24, 25 and 26 are going to be self-certification years, 27 would be a verification year, 28 and 29 would self-certify, and then verify again in 2030. If you have pre-HOTMA households that you did not verify their income or their assets by third party or first hand, you do not need to go back and get bank statements from when they moved in in 2020, um, but your new households moving in, you would want to be sure that you're meeting that requirement. Um, we That's going to be non-compliance in 25. Is that right, Amy? We've given that as technical assistance this year for the bond program on the third party verification of assets. At initial? Uh-huh. Or no. So we wanna be sure that you, the income certification that you're using is the department approved form. This is available on our website. Um, you would complete this after you gather all the verifications. You would execute it by all household or the all household adult members need to execute it. Staff signs on page two. There was a new form made available about a year ago, um, back in October of 23. We've made a couple of updates to that, but that is available on our website. And you want to be sure that you are using the most current version of the income certification form. Before you all jump into the questions box and tell us that your um, operating system won't load this or hasn't loaded it or isn't doing it until 2025, you may have to verify, you may have to fill out a hand certification or you may have to um, do this, you know, typed, or make sure the data is correct so that you can make sure that you're using the correct form. The operating system is something that you do as the management or ownership group. That is not a requirement, um, but you would wanna be sure that you're using the current income certification. Do we have anything pop up? I saw the little bubble. Um, what is the difference between data collection and full income? So data collection would be something you could do if you are 100% affordable under a program. You would be able to, under certain programs. So if you have um, housing tax credit and all of your units are 60% and you also have bond and all of your units are 60%, you could do what's called an annual data collection or annual eligibility certification, which we have, um, on our, on our website that you can use where you are just telling, you're just getting household information. You're not having to fully verify the income every year. Now, if you are housing tax credit with market units and your bond program is only 40% of your units are at bond, 60% um, or less, you're gonna have to do full annual income certifications. So you're gonna have to do that every year. And that's where that third year of tenancy, you'd have to verify the assets um, for the household by first hand or third party documentation. We do have a checklist that you can use as a courtesy on our website. And you would be able, if this is not a required form, but you can use it if you want to, if you wanna kind of know how, I think our checklist goes kind of in the order um, of, of how we would monitor a file. So if you wanna kind of get an idea of that, that's on our website. Um, you, may, you may have additional programming requirements. You ha may have ownership or management requirements. You want to be sure that you're adhering to all of those and not just the requirements for the department. So if you have a bond property that's layered with another entity, maybe you have project-based Section 8, or maybe you have home funds or something else from another entity, you want to be sure that you are complying with those requirements as well as the department requirements. 
So the income limits are issued annually by HUD or published annually by HUD. They are pro program and project specific. They are based on the number in the applicant group. You have to know where your property is located and you have to know what your required designations are in order to get the income limits to work for you. So when you go to our website, you're gonna to go to this income and rent tool. This is new, the spreadsheet, um, I think sent a message and said, I don't want to do this anymore. Please find a different way. So we found a different way. Um, but now we've got an online income and rent tool. So you'll click that link. You'll tell it what county you're in. The financing is bonds. You'll do your placed in service date and your deta determination notice effective date. And you'll click submit. And that's going to give you your income and rent limits for the area that you're in. You've got to know your information so that you can properly get, or you can get the right income and rent limits. But this is what that's gonna look like now instead of the Excel spreadsheet that we've used in years past. We'll do these polls and then we'll take a quick break, I think. Keep going. Perfect, oh, I did that. I can't find my mouse, it goes to sleep. <laughs> So if you didn't see the answer, then great. But bond developments must use the department application, true or false. Do we have any questions or anything else? Okay. Leave that open for a few more seconds. So far, most of you are getting it. Good job, thank you. All right, looks like everybody that's answered is, or that's gonna answer has answered. We are gonna close that. So almost all of you said this is false and that is correct. We do not have a required application, but you do have to have an application that screens for income assets and student status for all household members um, so that you can properly process your file for eligibility purposes. The next poll question is assets must be fully verified at the time of move in for all bond units. Yes, but never again. No, this is not required. Yes, and then again, once every three years. And there's more than one answer on this. So it's gonna depend on your, your funding sources and your, uh, your low income statuses for your units. So if you have, there, there's two different right answers. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this one. So the answer technically is C, but it might also be A. If you are 100% low income, meaning every unit is certified and verified at 60% or less, you don't have to recertify annually. So you could use the short research or the annual eligibility certification and you would not have to re-verify assets every three years. The bond program income and rent limits will be the same as the other program if the property is layered, true or false.
a two thirds split on this one. That tells me that about a third of you are layered with housing tax credit and bond. All right, I'm gonna close this poll. So about a third of you said it was true, but the answer's false. This is not always gonna be the same. So you wanna be sure that you are running your income and rent limits for each program and then applying them to each program based on your designations and your requirements for the program. If layered with another program, the designations for the bond program will match the other program designations. True or yes, they will match across all programs or no, each program will have their own requirements. Almost a perfect score on this one. Uh oh, power glitched. I know. Ours went out the other day at home, and I did not realize that it shut off the breaker to our garage, which means our freezer had no power. Thankfully, I caught it within a couple hours, but it's kind of one of those. Oh no. All right, you guys are still answering. All right, I'm going to close this poll. Almost all of you agree that no, each program is going to have its own requirements. So every program gets a land use restriction agreement or a regulatory agreement, and every program is going to have its own requirements. They might match. You might have housing tax credit where everything is at 60% and bond where everything is at 60%, but you might also not. So you want to be sure that you are treating each program separately and then um, applying them independently to make sure they are working together. So I think now is a good time to take, you think a 10 minute break, Amy? Or, yeah. Okay. We'll do a 10 minute break right now. We'll come back at 1040. And I'm going to mute and pause, but I will leave the screen up. So if you, you do not have to leave, but we'll, we'll be back in about 10 minutes.
Okay, welcome back, guys. Sorry, I couldn't find my buttons. So now we're going to talk about utility allowances. And for those of you, those of you that know me, you know this is my favorite thing. I just got through telling Amy I'm so excited. It's time to do all the end of year ones, and I'm excited to get to do those. But utility allowance for bond program is going to depend on if you have rent restrictions or not. If you are only bond and you do not have rent restrictions, you will not have a utility allowance that's approved by us. But if you are layered with another program or if you are bond with rent restrictions, you will have to have a utility allowance uh, that is updated annually. The Treasury Regulation 1.42-10, common, commonly called the Dash 10 Reg, is uh, the federally approved methodologies. Then we have a rule that outlines the five methodologies that we um, approve a review here in Texas and how those are to be implemented in our state. If you have programs in another state, I do not know how they do it in other states, so I am not gonna speak on that. I'm just talking about Texas here. What's included are the utilities paid by the resident, if they are paid directly to the provider or paid based on actual consumption to the owner. If they are paid based on a ratio utility billing system or rubs or an allocation method, you will not include those in the utility allowance. And phone, cable, and internet are considered amenities. They are not utilities, so they will never be included in the utility allowance. We do have a very detailed utility allowance training. We actually have two of them now. Um, so if you want more details on utility allowance, that would be where I would direct you to go. This is gonna be an overview as it pertains to the bond program. So there are seven total methodologies, the rural housing methodology, and you would have to have rural development funding at your property for this one. The HUD issued utility allowance, and for that one, you would have to have project-based section eight or RAD, something that is specifically driven by HUD where they issue and approve your utility allowance every year. And then you've got the uh, department ones. You've got the public housing authority methodology, written local estimate, um, the energy consumption model, actual use method, and HUD utility schedule model. So those are the five that would have um, department involvement in them kind of. Um, PHA we do not approve annually, but you do still have to obtain the most current version every year when the housing authority updates it. If a property has HUD regulated buildings like home units, home match, public housing, or project-based section eight, their utility allowance may be driven by that HUD regulated program. These are not the only programs that could make a building HUD regulated. These are just the more common ones that we see. There are requirements for annual review of the utility allowance. For rural housing and HUD issued utility allowances, you've got to follow their requirements. I'm not going to tell you, the department's not going to tell you how you need to do that one or how those are processed. You're going to need to touch base with those folks and do, I think with rural housing, it's done through the budget process. And with the HUD issued uh, utility allowances, it is done through um, an entity that processes those and does kind of an average review to get those processed. For the PHA method, owners are responsible for periodically touching base with the housing authority to make sure they are using the most current version of the PHA schedule. There are a lot of entities that update these around this time of year um, or around the first of the year. So you wanna be sure that you are checking on that. I would recommend that you check once a quarter. Um, just send a quick email that says, hey, you know, do y'all have a new schedule? If they put it online, that makes it even easier. Check that website. Um, when it gets a close to the time where they're doing it, I would check it more frequently. If they usually post in October, then I think I would check probably pretty regularly in October so I make sure I don't miss that date. Um, and you, because you've got to implement them for rents due 90 days after the effective date. Um, you can implement it immediately, but it has to be implemented 90 days. So if it, if they post it with an effective date of October 1st, it's going to have to be in place for rents due after December 31st. Written local estimate, HUD utility schedule model, and energy consumption model have to be submitted to the department once a year by October 1st. That date has come and gone. However, if you did not submit this year and you planned to or you meant to, get a, a compliance submission together now, get it submitted better late than never, 
so that we can get it uh, submitted within the calendar year. Um, it will have missed the October 1st deadline, but it'll still be uh, within the calendar year. So you have to submit those, and then we would issue a response, written local estimate we don't approve, HUD utility schedule model and energy consumption model we do, written local estimate we acknowledge, um, because that's from the provider and statute says that that is, that is the winner if it is done. Um, so that, that is kind of why we acknowledge that, but we do not specifically review every piece of that like we would these others. That is reviewed during a monitoring review though. Actual use methodology is due every year by August 1st. That is um, That date is long gone, but if this is a methodology that you want to pursue, please feel free to reach out um, and we can talk about kind of what you need to do to get set up for that process. A utility allowance is considered implemented once the unit status report is updated and rents are restricted. Utility allowances for department programs are effective the date they're effective. You don't wait until recertification dates to put those on the unit status report. You would put those in on the effective date. So if it's effective for rents due after uh, December 18th, on January 1st for those rents, we would expect the unit status report to reflect for all units that new utility allowance and all the rents would need to be restricted by that time. With the exception of multifamily direct loan programs, um, if the owner fails to submit for annual review of the utility allowance and we come out to market and they've missed, you've missed the annual review requirement, we are going to default and use the PHA in your area. If you don't have a PHA, then you would not have a utility allowance with which we could conduct the review. You are going to have an issue of noncompliance with regards to utility allowances on either of these instances. But if we have to use the PHA, that in turn usually creates some gross rent issues. Um, the other one can too. If you have multifamily direct loan funds at your property, we're gonna issue those annually sometime after October 1st, but before December 31st. If you don't get a response from us, you would need to reach out to us and just say, hey, Kara, I think this might've fallen off your list. Um, there's probably a reason, or maybe it's a new funding source, something like that. If any of you have home match units, that is gonna follow that multifamily direct loan process, and it would be considered HUD regulated. There is a way to change methodologies, but you cannot do that without approval. You can also not change the utilities for which a tenant is responsible without approval from the department. You have to submit a package just like you would submit a utility allowance package for an annual review. You tell us you're changing. We're gonna review it within 90 days or 45 days if it's an actual use request. And then we're gonna issue a response you've got to post to the notice, you've got to post the notice to residents and submit to the department at the same time. And that should be within a reasonable amount of time from when you received the report from whoever created it or when you created your HUD model or got your written local estimate letter back. So you wanna be sure that you're paying attention to those dates and you're not getting it in July, posting in July, but not submitting to the department until October. That can delay the implementation and we do have written in our rule an allowance to where we can then say, okay, you submitted to us on this day, that starts your 90 day window. You can't implement for 90 days from your submission date. So make sure those all go hand in hand. For the most part, they do. You guys have gotten really good at that. I've not had a lot of issues with that lately. Additionally, if you are starting or stopping the charging of a utility, you cannot do that while a tenant is in a lease term. If you say we're gonna start billing water and sewer through a sub-metered system or through an allocated system, you cannot do that until that tenant signs a new lease contract that includes that utility. So that is something to be aware of. There might be times where you have two utility allowances when you're adding in utilities or taking out utilities. And that would be an additional thing that would have to be monitored by your staff. So for combining methodologies, this is allowed as long as you are not HUD regulated. If you are HUD regulated, even for having home or home match units at your property, you cannot combine methodologies. But if you are just bond or bond and tax credit and you wanna use the HUD model for electric and the PHA for your gas, you can do that, but you need to be very aware that those two have different review requirements, they have different annual requirements, 
and different posting requirements. So you wanna be sure that your staff is well aware of that and is um, properly calendaring and, and tracking those requirements. So we've got a poll here. Bond developments without rent restrictions are not required to have a utility allowance reviewed by the department. True, if there are no rent restrictions, there's no UA, false, the department still reviews the UA. Maybe, are there other layered programs in effect? Need to get some sort of music to play in the background. <laughs> if you only play a certain like six seconds, it doesn't, you don't have to pay for copyrights. I think I learned the other day. Six seconds doesn't do anybody any good. Pretty divided on this one. So we will talk about this. I forgot to pause for the break. All right, I'm gonna close this one. Looks like the answers have finished. The answer is C. If there are other layered programs, you're gonna to have to follow those, those rent restrictions, even if your bond program does not have a rent restriction. But if you are just bond and you do not have rent restrictions, you would not have a utility allowance from the department. And I wanna say we have at least one property that falls in this category. Um, for the most part, you guys are layered, but there are a handful that have just bond. And if your bond does not have rent restrictions, you would not have a utility allowance from us. Bond developments can use any methodology for the utility allowance that they want to, true or false. Let me launch that one. So remember there's two methods where you have to have another funding source to use. And then there are five that we talked about. All right, I'm going to close this one. The answer is false. If you aren't layered with rural development, you can't use rural development. If you are layered with home funds, you can't use the PHA method. So there are some caveats that go on, go into this or stipulations that go into this that might dictate what utility allowance you can use. Um, but for the most part, those five department options, you can use the federally allowed uh, methodologies. An owner can change the utility allowance methodology without department approval. Yes, it's their property. They can change if they want to, sung to the tune of it's my party, I can cry if I want to. No, the department must approve changes to the methodology and or utilities for tenants. What do you guys think? Right out of the gate, 100%, good job. All right, looks like 
answering has stopped. So I'm gonna close this one. Almost all of you said, no, the department has to approve changes to the methodology and or utilities for tenants. Some of them that includes annual review, but for sure, if you're changing methodologies or you're changing where you're no longer gonna charge tenants for water and sewer, you have to get approval first. Are there any utility allowance questions that we need to go over or anything? Okay, so the next piece of the bond puzzle is supportive services. And I know we touched on this when we were talking about the regulatory agreement earlier, but now we're gonna get into a little more detail about it. If the development's LURA or regulatory agreement re requires the provision of supportive services, the department is gonna confirm that that requirement is being met when we conduct a monitoring review. Owners are required to maintain sufficient documentation like flyers, uh, sign-in sheets, newsletters, that sort of a thing to show that they are providing the services. If it's your first monitoring review, you can send us a list of what you plan to do for the year or for the you know, quarter. Sometimes it's hard to plan a whole year but you need to have dates and you need to have specific what you're going to offer. Don't just tell us, well, we're going to do these three things sometime this year. Um, you've got to have specific dates, at least to tell us you've got a good plan in place for that first year. Um, evidence of services has to be submitted to the department upon request, which is usually going to be during a monitoring review. If the development's LURA requires a monthly expenditure, remember we looked at that $10 per unit, that is gonna have to be uh, submitted as well during a monitoring review. And we're gonna need to see invoices that show what you're spending um, you know, on that. If the development's LURA requires a monthly expenditure as part of the provision of services, we will monitor that. You can include costs, that are directly related to providing the services. They can include contracting of services with qualified providers, cost of notification, like a monthly newsletter, or if you have your flyers done in a fancy way or something. Um, other costs that can be documented but would only be incurred as a result of the service. You cannot include the cost of your copy machine or the cost of your cleaning folks or um, your office supplies or your leasing agent salary. That's stuff that you would have as the normal operating expenses for the, it's the cost of doing business. So that would not be able to be included. Um, so you need to be reasonable. It needs to be something that's specifically related to the provision of services. The lists above are not inclusive, um, but you, you would wanna be sure that you are um, following, you know, those kind of as a guide. And then we would review them um, at the time of a monitoring review to make sure they fall within that. So we've got a poll question here. I'm gonna leave it up on the screen for just a second. The owner has 250 units. 40% are required to be restricted at 60% AMI with 100% of the units reserved for eligible tenants. And the expenditure requirement is $10 per month. How much must the owner expend monthly? I'm gonna launch the poll. So we have 250 units, $10 a unit, 40% are rent are income restricted under the bond program, but 100% of the units are eligible tenant units. So are we gonna spend nothing, 250 a month, 2,500 a month, or 25,000 a month? All right, I'm gonna close this one a little bit lower. Not everybody wanted to do math this early on a Tuesday. I'm with you. So the answer is 2,500. You've got $10 per unit, 
250 units because all the units are restricted under the bond program as eligible tenants. 2,500 per month is what the owner would have to evidence the expenditure is for supportive services. You can see here this little snippet that told us that. If your regulatory agreement doesn't have this, you can still have a company or an entity complete your supportive services. You don't have to do them in-house if it's something that you wanna have done, but we would not monitor for that expenditure if this is not in your bond uh, regulatory agreement. A substantive modification to the scope of tenant services. So if you wanna change what you want to offer, that has to go through a LURA amendment process. If you are wanting to change who the provider is, that does not have to go through a LURA amendment. A failure to comply with the requirements of the supportive services section will result in an issue of non-compliance. You want to be sure that you are familiar with the requirements of the LURA or the regulatory agreements. You want to advertise effectively. You want to tell your tenants what's going on. Send out monthly notifications. You can do newsletters, calendars, flyers. If you have social media, you can set the events up there. You can do all those things. If your staff is energetic and excited about the events, that's going to flow through to your tenant. Um, when we go out to properties and they are, they've got a staff that truly, you know, does a lot of services and is really excited about them, those are the properties where we see lots of tenants coming in and saying, oh, are we not having bingo today? Or, oh, are we not having, you know, the coffee and donuts today, whatever the, the service may be. Um, you want to be sure that you are properly documenting all services held so that you can provide that documentation to us when we come out to monitor. Um, you want to be sure that when the land use restriction agreement tells you who is supposed to provide a service or what the service is or where the service is supposed to be held and when it is that you're adhering to that. So some of the services, um, especially in the newer land use restriction agreements or regulatory agreements, is going to say if you're going to offer GED prep, it has to be done by a licensed instructor. English as a second language by a licensed instructor what the services are gonna be outlined specifically. As the regulatory agreements have aged, we've gotten more detailed in what we've provided. If you are not sure what falls under a specific thing, if you've got one of those older generation LURAs, you can reach out to a monitor and we can say, okay, we, what we've seen is this, or we would, re if you've got an idea, we could say, oh yeah, that would probably be okay, or no, I don't really think that meets the threshold. Services have to be offered on site or transportation has to be offered for the household to get to the service. And then some of the newer LURAs dictate when a service is to be offered. Some of the older ones don't, but if it says childcare services and you send to Amy a sign-in sheet for one day of the year that you had childcare services, that's not gonna meet the threshold of the requirement. If you have got financial planning and you do that twice in a year, that probably would be okay because I don't know that people need to financially plan every single month. Exercise classes probably need to be done more than once a month or once a year. So you're gonna to wanna to use a reasonable judgment if you have one of those older versions that is not as specific. So like you can see here, there's the list in that box. Home buyer education, maybe you do that once a year. Vocational training, maybe you have somebody that comes in once a quarter, if that's one that you have. Scholastic tutoring probably can't just be the first Thursday of every third month. It probably needs to be, you know, a couple of days a week for your school-aged kids if you have a property with school-aged people at your, at your community. You can also see there that this one is required to be done in coordination with workforce development and welfare programs. So you're going to need to reach out to those entities in your area and say, hey, will you come out and offer such and such service, or do you have resources that our tenants could use for these services, that sort of a thing. The newer land use restriction agreements are much more detailed. You can see there that it's got 12 hours of weekly organized on-site activities for K through 12 children by a dedicated service coordinator or third party entity. You've got you know, monthly transportation to community or social events. You've got some real specifics in this and you've got to meet a threshold of eight points. 
So you want to be sure that whatever generation your regulatory agreement falls under, that you are complying with those requirements. And like I said earlier, we do have a very detailed supportive services training that would be beneficial to anybody that has this requirement so that you have a chance to really kind of dig into the nuts and bolts of the supportive services requirement. You want to maintain the documentation. So if you send out a newsletter, keep a monthly newsletter. You want to send out a calendar, keep your calendar so that at the end of the year, you can say, okay, I had this, 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 and this. Here are all my sign-in sheets. And when we come conduct a monitoring review, if you want to provide us evidence of the two most recent services. So if it's monthly, send us the two months worth. If it's quarterly, send us the last two quarters. If it's weekly, send us two weeks worth. If it is a weekday requirement, send us two weeks worth. If it is an annual requirement, send us what you did the last time and when you're gonna have it again, unless you just did it. So if I'm monitoring your property in October and you just had your tax prep in um, September, I don't know that that would really be the right time frame to have that, but if that's when you did it and you've got that, I'm probably gonna be okay with that. But if you did it back in February, you're probably going to need to send me February and tell me, hey, we're planning to do this again in February of, of next year, so that I know that's something you're going to continually offer on an annual basis. So we've got some polls here. Supportive services for the bond program end after 15 years. We talked about this this morning, so hopefully everybody remembers. Yes, the federal compliance period is only 15 years, or no, services are required for the term of the bond LURA, or regulatory agreement. Couple more seconds for this one. All right, I'm going to close the review, the poll. It looks like most of you got this right. You said B. Remember, for the bond program, it doesn't tell you when they have to end. So there's nothing in here that says it ends with the first 15 years. It says through the state restrictive period or through the term. So there is no end after 15 years like there would be in tax credit, where it might just say throughout the compliance period. But a lot of our newer tax credit land use restriction agreements are through the entire term. So that is something you wanna be looking for if you've got newer funding sources or newer funds coming to your property. All bond developments have a monthly required expenditure for supportive services, true or false? Remember, we looked at those two pieces side by side. One had a specific sentence highlighted and one did not. All right, I'm gonna close this one. It looks like the answers have slowed down. This is false. Not everybody has an expenditure requirement. You've got to look in your section of your regulatory agreement to see if you're gonna have that or not. That's not always something that's required, but that is something that if it is required, it will be detailed in the regulatory agreement. And it's not always $10. Um, I've seen $12 and I think I've seen $7. I don't know what the threshold is for those amounts, um, but that's, those are the ones I can think of. 
If tenants do not attend the offered services, it means we don't have to have them anymore. True or false? We did not really talk about this, but what do you guys think? And we are perfectly good on time. So if you guys have questions, feel free to put those in the questions box. We are not going to run out of time. We're not, Amy and I are not running away from you. We want to be sure your questions get answered. All right. Looks like everybody that's voted is going to vote. Oh, there's a couple more coming in. All right. I'm going to close this one. That is false. You can change what's offered. You can change your configuration of services, but you still have to offer supportive services to meet the requirements in your regulatory agreement. You can't just say, well, nobody came to the parenting classes I was offering, so now I'm going to be done offering parenting classes. Maybe it's time to survey your tenant population and find out what they would rather have. Let them choose. You would also need to update your tenant rights and resources guide if you're going to change your services. Some folks have all the services listed and, and let them know, you know, hey, it's going to be a, a selection of these items. Um, so that would give your folks a chance to know kind of what the options were. Give them a chance to tell you, hey, I'd really like to see, you know, GED prep or English as a second language or um, scholastic tutoring, that kind of a thing. Are there any questions on supportive services for the bond program? All right. So now we're going to talk about bond and other programs. And this is where it gets, if you just have bond, then this would not apply to you. But if you've got bond layered with other programs, that this is where you are going to have to manage those two programs kind of separately, but together. So when a property has only bond funding, we are only going to monitor under the bond regulatory agreement. Bond does not go post 15. Bond supportive service requirements continue through the term of the bond regulatory agreement. Bond annual certifications will be dictated by the set aside. 100% bond at 50% and or 60% area median income means you can use the annual eligibility certification. A mixed income bond development with market or eligible tenants means that there has to be a full annual income certification conducted. Market and eligible tenant student or eligible tenant units do not require annual recertifications. This is an instance where it's very important that you designate your unit status report correctly and you tell us what percentage, which units are under the bond restrictions and which units are your eligible tenant units. Uh, the bond program units that become over income will follow the next available unit rule. Remember, we talked about that, that with bond only. That is a development wide requirement. Hopefully, I said that right this time. For the available unit rule, and you want to be sure that you are tracking when those households become over income and designating them as such on your unit status report. Bond projects are property wide. There are no building applicable fractions. Some bond LURAs do not have rent restrictions. And the key to success with the bond program is to read the LURA and ask questions. If you do not understand a piece of your bond regulatory agreement, you can reach out to a monitor. You can reach out to your compliance division or your ownership. Maybe they know, but you are welcome to reach out to us at the department so that we can help. And remember, eligible tenants do not have to have annual certification requirements. They do need to be designated correctly on the um, unit status report. And your regulatory agreement is going to tell you the definition of an eligible tenant. So they're going to have a different, they're going to have a higher income limit than what your uh, regular households would be. They're, I think it's 140% of the area median income where your property is located. So you've got, you've got to reference that eligible tenant definition um, and qualify them as eligible tenants in the beginning. They would be designated as eligible tenants on the um, income certification and on the unit status report, but you want to be sure that those are designated correctly and that you're following that eligible tenant de uh, definition. 
I know somebody earlier asked about eligible tenants and I wanted to be sure we got it that. Yeah, we did have a question that comes in. It says, so for eligible tenants, they must be qualified as an affordable household initially, but do not have to recertify, correct? For eligible tenant households, they have to be certified as an eligible tenant household initially, but they do not have to recertify. That is correct. But your eligible tenant requirements are different than your low income requirements. So you would have, if you have eligible tenants at your bond property, you can, they have a higher income limit. They have different, the, the definition is going to be what's in your regulatory agreement. And if you want to reference your handout, you can look at the, the definition that I have at the very, very beginning on the definitions page. I want to say it's like the seventh or eighth slide maybe um, that has that eligible tenant definition. And if you're still running into questions, feel free to reach out and we can talk about it specifically for your property. If you are bond layered with housing tax credit, when two or more programs are layered on the same development, each qualified low income household must qualify under the programs that are applicable to the unit. 100% housing tax credit layered with 100% bond, meaning both units or all units meet both program requirements, that program or property can do annual certification as long as the housing tax credit program has everybody designated at 60% or less, if you are average income, that is going to be a different answer. 100% housing tax credit layered with 40% bond where all the units meet the housing tax credit requirements and 40% of the units meet the bond requirements, you can still do the annual eligibility certification and your unit status report should reflect everybody under the housing tax credit, and then 40% of your units under bond with the remaining 60% of your units designated as eligible tenants. Mixed income for housing tax credit and 40% bond with eligible tenants on the remaining 60% of units under the bond program would mean that you have got to have annual income certifications completed. So you can see here, we've got a 40% bond deal, Mixed income housing tax credit, the property has 400 units. 80% of those units have to be designated as 60% AMI under the tax credit program. So that's 320 units. The remaining 80 units are market. The unit status report should reflect that designation mix. 40% of the units are designated as 60% AMI under the bond program. So that's 160 units. The remaining 240 units are eligible tenant units. The USR should reflect that designation. Your 80 market units are also gonna be your eligible tenant units. That piece is easy, but then you still have a remainder of 160 units that are gonna be eligible tenants, but are restricted at 60% AMI under the housing tax credit program. Annually, all low income units, the 320 housing tax credit and the 160 bond must be fully income certified. Market units under the housing tax credit program do not require initial or annual certification. Bond eligible tenant units require initial certification, but there are no annual certification requirements. And for this example, when this housing tax credit program goes post 15, those 160 bond units have to continue to be annually income certified because now you've still got your market units under your housing tax credit and not 100% of the units meet the low income definition under the bond program. So you would still have to fully certify those bond units annually. So this would be an instance where an initial for the bond units, for all bond units, you are doing the... Um, third party or first hand asset verification. And then annually on those 160 units, you are doing it once every three years for the asset verification for that bond program. So you can see here, we've got the development has to be a rental, pro a qualified rental project within the meaning of 142D. This is 142D where it tells you that it is going to be uh, 20% of all the units are going to be restricted at 50% or less, or 40% are going to be restricted at 60% or less. Um, 
we, I believe most of ours are that 60%. I don't know that we have any bonds that have elected the 50%. I can't think of any, but I guess that's possible. And then here again is the definition of eligible tenant from this land use restriction agreement example. And we can read through that because I know that's been a couple questions. Um, an eligible tenant is defined as an individual and family of extremely low, low and very low income, families of moderate income, um, persons with special needs with an annual income that does not exceed 140% of the area median income for a four person household in the applicable standard metropolitan statistical area or MSA, provided that all low income tenants shall count as eligible tenants. So that tells you what an eligible tenant is. So you could list those things and then make sure that any of those households are not over that 140% area median income for a four person household in the MSA. So that is your definition specifically for an eligible tenant. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about average income layered with bond. And here we've got mixed income. We've got oh, 119 total units where 79.83 of those are restricted under the tax credit program. That's 48 units, or no, that's 95 units, sorry. And then we've got our bond designation showing that 40% of the 119 are restricted at 60% or less. That means 71 of the units are eligible tenants. So we've got 119 total units, 95 of those are tax credit, but we've got designations that go over the 60%. So our 70% and 80% tax credit units have to be layered with eligible tenant units under the bond program because bond only recognizes 60% and below as low income units. And I know we talked about that when the average income stuff all came out that it didn't really communicate with the bond, maybe that, maybe bond will, you know, be updated to include 70 and 80%, but right now it does not. So we would want to be sure that we are tracking these two things kind of separately, but also um, alongside each other. But now we've got 100% of our units that are designated under the average income program. And our bond is still 40%. So we, we have 119 low income units under housing tax credit. But remember bond does not recognize 70% and 80% as low income. So we still have to have those designated as eligible tenants. And with this one, even though for the housing tax credit program, we can do an AEC. For bond, we have to do full annual income certifications on those 48 units that are required to be at 60% AMI. Because of the average income layering where our 70% and 80% designations do not um, qualify as low income under the bond program. So for bond looking at this, this is not a 100% low income property where everything has been certified at 60% or less. So for those 48 bond units, you are gonna have to annually income certify. But for the tax credit program, you could use the AEC on all 119 units. So bond has the same, are there, what, before I go on, are there questions? Okay. Bond has the same student restrictions that the housing tax credit program has. Eligible tenant units may be full-time student households without meeting an exception for the bond program. But if you are, 100% tax credit with your bond or mixed income tax credit with your bond, you still have to meet the student requirements for those households under the layered program. A bond and post-15 housing tax credit property will still have to qualify student households for their low-income bond units, not for the eligible tenants. So this is where on this one, if it goes post-15, um, you would have your 48 units that still have to be fully student eligible. And then your eligible tenant units would not if that property were post 15. We've got a poll here. If the development has market units 
under the housing tax credit program and eligible tenants under the bond program, AEC forms can be used true or false. We did do a very detailed student training as well. Um, part of the change under the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act was the treatment of student financial assistance in your households. We went through that um, and we went through the student eligibility stuff. So that, that's a good place to go as a resource as well. All right. Oh, we're not getting as much poll response now. Stay with us. All right, I'm going to close the poll. And most of you said false, but that is correct. Because not all households are certified as 60% or less under a low income program, they cannot use AECs for the bond program. A mixed income post 15 property, post 15 tax credit property with bond units has to complete full annual income certifications on the bond units, true or false. Kind of goes with the same example we just had. Give this just a few more seconds. Looks like people are still answering. All right, I'm going to close this one. Most of you answered true which is correct. Uh oh, did it not update? Um, I know it's still sharing the poll. Mm -hmm. There we go, okay. Sorry about that guys. So yes, this is true. There would have to be full annual income certifications because that mixed income piece on the tax credit side means you've got households that are moving in that are not certified as 60% or less under another low income program. So the bond program will require full income certification. The bond program still has reporting requirements as outlined in the TIN tax, uh, section 10.607. One of these is the annual owner's compliance report, which is three parts and the annual owner financial certification and forms 8703 for the bond program. This is due April 30th for the previous calendar year. And the first report is due the second year after an award. So you wanna keep this in mind. You wanna make sure that you have this calendared every year. Um, if you If you are the person responsible for doing this, then at the end of the year, you wanna kind of have the December 31st data left in your unit status report until you're able to submit this. Um, and it is due by April 30th, but you can submit the unit status report sooner. You don't have to wait till April 30th. The other thing that you're gonna have to submit is the periodic unit status report. They are due on the 10th of January, April, July, and October for the quarter ending the month prior. So the report due January 10th is for the last quarter of the year prior. First reports are due after leasing commences. So if you start leasing, if you start your lease up, that's when you need to start doing these reports. And these are submitted through CMTS. You would go through the, the reporting section 
and do you know the reports make sure your unit status report is updated um, so that there's kind of a at least once a quarter a real-time uh, review of your unit status report for monitoring reviews the due date is identified in the notification of the review and you would want to make sure that you've got to you've got a current and correct unit status report in there that is what we use to prepare for the report the review so if we come out and we make our file selections based on that unit status report um and then every file you say oh they moved out a month ago oh they moved out six months ago oh they moved out a year ago then you obviously did not submit a current unit status report we don't have that happen a lot but it does happen from time to time so you want to be sure that your unit status report is current and correct when you have the request made for a monitoring review or your periodic unit status reports, which are also called quarterly vacancy reports, and your annual owner's compliance report. Owners are encouraged to continuously maintain a unit status report um, with current resident data. That's going to make it easier to submit when a report is due. All rental developments funded or administered by the department have to submit a unit status report that is accurate at the time of a monitoring review or um, a physical inspection. And then that last one is a newer thing that we that was added to the requirements within six months, but at least 90 days prior to the end of an affordability period or the end of a, of a land use restriction term, the owner has to provide notice to the tenants and the applicants. The owner has to uh, tell them what's going to happen with the property, what are the rents going to be, are they going to be able to stay, and then give them the link to the uh, department's vacancy clearinghouse so that they can uh, find affordable housing in their area. If the owner has been given um, or has been awarded new funding for the same property, if they're going to go through a rehab or it's going to get an additional award of bonds, that sort of thing, you do not have to do this because it's going to stay restricted, it's going to stay a low income property. Um, under the same same types of requirements so that would not be required but if you are um, leaving the program and you are truly letting that regulatory term end and you are not having new funds added you would have to notify your tenants accordingly we talked about cmts a little bit earlier and how it's got to be updated and it's got to be current and correct and then here's kind of the citation that goes with that Within 10 days of a change to the contact information, you want to be sure CMTS is updated. So some of you guys, when you're being built, your address says corner of Highway 60 and 25 Mile Avenue. You want to be sure that when you have an actual physical address, that is updated in CMTS. When your manager changes, you want to update that. When somebody with the compliance group changes, you need to update that. That all needs to be updated timely. You should maintain separate contact information for the ownership and the management company. If it truly is a solo entity that runs everything, that's fine. Um, I would encourage you to have a secondary person at least that can um, help monitor the CMTS announcements so that you don't accidentally miss something. But that may not always be possible. Sometimes it is truly just a one person show and that would need to be you know, that one person. Um, in which case you want to be sure that you are checking that CMTS attachment system so an announcement doesn't get lost in your junk folder or something like that. You also need to be aware that failure to comply with this is an issue of non-compliance. If I come out to your property, I don't need the um, corporate office phone number in CMTS. I need the property phone number because if something happens and I come early or I'm going to be late, I need to be able to contact that property um, and there are times where we call the number that's listed in CMTS and it turns out it's the uh, management office or it's the ownership entity and it's kind of a runaround. And so it causes some delays in what should otherwise be a pretty seamless uh, monitoring review trip. So you wanna be sure that that is current and correct so that we can reach out to the properties when needed um, and also reach out to the ownership or the management company if we get a complaint Sometimes we have to reach out to the ownership or the management group and we need the current and correct information for that. Developments with bond funding only are, only are not required to comply with the reporting requirements. Is that true or false? What do we think?
working that for just a little bit longer. We've still got some answers coming through. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close this one. The answer is false, which is what almost all of you said. So that is great. You do have to report. A bond does go through the, um, it's like a desk review. It's not the same thing as a desk monitoring review, but where we do a desk review and we look at those quarterly vacancy reports and we make sure, you know, just kind of a quick glance that everything is as it should be. You get a letter from our desk review team that says, hey, this was satisfied with an onsite, or hey, your desk review had some issues. That gives you an opportunity to look at that before a monitoring review and say, oh, okay, I need to look closer at this or I need to fix this. And when you join, when the bond program is awarded to the property, you will get a welcome to the bond program uh, desk review letter that kind of tells you how that's going to work. So now we kind of have our miscellaneous section. We've got an income determination training that we conduct every quarter in person at the Rusk building. Our next one is gonna be December the 5th. Registration will open that first week of November, probably right around the 5th or 6th. Um, if you, so if you are in Austin and you wanna to come to that in-person training, you can do that. We do have a recording of that available online at that link you see at the bottom that Amy's also put in the chat box. We do our housing tax credit and multifamily direct loan training through the Texas Apartment Association. We have completed all of our housing tax credit trainings for the year. We do have multifamily direct loan training coming up on November the 12th. Um, so if that is something that you need, you can also register through them. I believe there's an INSPIRE training tomorrow. Um, so if that's something you need, now would be the time to go register at that TAA link there that you can see uh, for those trainings. We conduct a monthly office hours. They're usually the second or third Friday of the month. Sometimes Amy or my schedule gets a little bit wonky and we have to move them because of vacations or holidays or you know sick kids or whatever the case may be. There might be some reasons that that has to get moved but they are usually around the second or third Friday of the month. They are a great resource. We do a mini training. Last week we hosted our October one and we talked about HOTMA for the mini training. Um, that part is recorded and posted on our presentations website. Then we do an open forum and that is not recorded. So it is an opportunity for you to log in as a housing partner and just say, hey guys, how do you handle this? Or hey, I have this happening, what is this about? Um, and we've got lots of good questions that come through that. It's a great opportunity for you to ask a question, um, you know, that, you know, maybe is property specific, um, maybe is not, but is something that you can just get a real-time answer from a person instead of going through an email back and forth or, you know, waiting on a returned phone call. And those do happen once a month. Um, we are continuing those in 2025. The mini trainings, I think, are going to take a different look. Um, but when you get your survey for this webinar, it's going to ask you, are there any other training topics that you would like to see done by the department? That's where I get some of those ideas. I look at what you guys tell me and what you guys email me. And that is where um, some of these office hour topics come from. And that, that's actually where the bond training topic came from because that was a response we were getting a lot. Folks were wanting to see that. And so that is why uh, we did that. And then again, the recorded webinars and resources are posted here. We do put the handouts and if applicable, the handouts with answers in those sections um, so that you can use those as a resource for new staff or if you need a refresher, um, you, can, that you can go to those videos on YouTube and you can watch those recorded trainings. This one will be posted. Um, I don't know that I'll get it posted this week. Um, it's gonna be a, a pretty big video, so it might take a little bit, but um, it will be posted by the end of next week. There will be an announcement that goes out um, and it'll be posted along with its handout. I do have two more poll questions, so don't leave on me yet. Bond initial income certifications require full asset verifications by firsthand or third party documentation, yes or no? And I know this is the second time this question's been asked, but I wanna be sure that everybody understands this is 
the, the requirements of this. Leave it open for just a little bit longer. Looks like everybody that's voted is going to vote. So I'm going to close that. Almost all of you agree that this is yes. This is a requirement. You do not need to go backwards, but update your policies and procedures today and um, start verifying those assets going forward for your bond program units. Remember that does include your eligible tenants as far as initial certifications go. You wanna be sure that your files keep that in there, but you also don't have to get six months worth of statements anymore. You can get one um, bank statement to verify an asset now. So that's that makes it a little bit easier. Can you email a compliance monitor with questions for your bond program requirements? Yes or no? While y'all are answering that poll, I could put mine and Amy's email addresses in again. All right, I'm gonna close this one. It looks like everybody that's voted is gonna, or that's gonna vote has voted. The answer is yes, you absolutely can. Remember all of our emails and phone numbers are listed on that compliance division contact website, um, or you can reach out to me or Amy or Carolyn. Um, any of us can help. Um, and if we don't know the answer, we're gonna you know, do some research and find it. So you might not get an immediate answer because we might need to read through a regulatory agreement or do some research, but we will definitely help get the answer that you need. That is all that I have today. We've got about 17 minutes left of our scheduled training time. Um, if you are done, you've gotten all your questions answered and you do not want to stay with us for these last 16 or 17 minutes, please feel free to log off. I would appreciate it if you would complete the survey questionnaire that's going to pop up when you leave the webinar. Um, if you if you have questions that you ask on that survey, I do follow up with folks through email, um, just as kind of an added resource. If you do not wish for that to happen, um, please, you know, just feel free to ignore my email. Um, but I do appreciate uh, the responses that we see there. It helps me know if I hit the mark or did not. Um, but if you have questions, now's the time to put them in there. Amy and I are here until noon. Um, unless it just completely dies off and then we will end the webinar sooner. Thank you guys for joining us today. We appreciate it. Yeah, I hope, thank you so much. Hope you all learned things and enjoyed it. And I hope you like my little dinosaurs. <laughs> Pretty accurate. My youngest, who just turned five, tells me all the time, uh, we'll just cross that bridge when we get to it. And I'm like, you're five. How many bridges are you crossing? This is not serious, though. So. Oh, you're so kind. You're so kind, Pamela. Thank you. We enjoy doing these for you guys. Folks leaving. Still have lots of folks, so I don't want to close it if anybody has any questions. Hope everybody has a wonderful lunch and a good rest of the week. <laughs>